It's the Life Upfront Engineering Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Waters, covering ideas, people, and products on the cutting edge of product development. As always, join the conversation at lifeupfront.com. Today on the show, Jonas Latt, CEO of FlowKit, an innovative CFD company based near Geneva, Switzerland. And a quick note before we get started, this discussion will be a two-parter, so watch for the second part, which will be available in a couple of weeks, or now, depending on when you're listening to this. And uh, I'll have that posted at lifeupfront.com slash flowkit2, flowkit the number two. Jonas, welcome to the show. Hello, Jeff. So I think we've probably known each other for about a year, right? I would say so, yes. I, I think a year, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Well, your team is working on at least three ideas that originally caught my attention. Uh, things I'm passionate about, CFD, uh, Lattice Boltzmann, open source CAE, and the cloud. Um, I don't think we're going to be able to cover all of those. That's where we're going to break this up into two parts. But to start off, um, you know, could you please share a little bit of the story about your team, Palabos and, and FlowKit, and what you're doing? Yes, of course. So uh we we have this this company here in Switzerland so it was founded by me and a few colleagues we are all physicists engineers the thing started a few years ago so we we most of us come from academia so we were in research in computational fluid dynamics and at some point we just sat down and started to develop a software uh, a software application in CFD and as the software evolved and became better after four or five, year, five years or so we decided to go commercial and founded the Flowkit company. What's special about the company is that we don't charge license costs for the usage of that software. It's free and open source, so you just go ahead and download it and, and use it. And on our side, what we offer is commercial support and, and CFD, uh, CFD consulting. I see, I see. So um, we're going to get to that a little bit. I think the open source piece is one of the more interesting parts of what you're doing. Um, now, now let's back up a minute. Uh, there are a lot of CFD codes out there uh, on the market. Uh, very few of them have the same kind of engine under the hood uh, that you do, namely this uh, Lattice Boltzmann approach to CFD. It's totally different than what most people have even heard of that are in the CFD world today. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the differences just on a high level? Um, you know, let's say for people who are not numerical physicists. Yes, of course. That's right. I didn't even talk about that in my summary. Our flow solver is special because it uses the lattice Boltzmann method. So I would say that this method is fundamentally different to classical CFD in two points. The first is computational efficiency. And the second is, uh, so to say, the level of sophistication you can reach in the physical modeling of, of the fluids. So I can give you some background of that modeling approach of Lattice Boltzmann, so you understand this better. You see, in classical CFT, you always do the same thing. You simplify, you simplify the, the physics with, with the help of a differential equation, and then you use, a numerical, use numerical analysis to solve that equation. This is very, very standard, and people have forgotten that this very idea to use a differential equation as a model for the physics, that this comes from the times when there were no computers. So a hundred years ago, this was your best bet to get some understanding of what fluid flow is. But nowadays, this is not optimal because it puts the computer at the very end of the production pipeline. You first do the math, and then you do the numerical analysis, and then you try to implement everything on the computer. But if your implementation is slow or inefficient, there's very little you can do. So with Lattice Boltzmann, we take the reverse path. We think about how to implement the physics of a problem right away on a computer. And we do math afterwards to, to make sure that everything is accurate. At, with Lattice Boltzmann, you look, you look at the fluid at the level of the molecules and you say, OK, can we simulate the motion of these molecules directly on the computer in a simplified way, of course? And can we have something that represents the real physics of the fluid and not just some mathematical model on the computer? So intuitively, this is easy to be to implement in an efficient way because if you want to be parallel as an example you just take different molecules and put them on different processors and just shuffle them around processors and get some 
efficient way of having the physics. And once we have done that, we, we take a, st a step back, do the mathematics, do the differential, differential equations, and analyze what is going on. But fundamentally, we did the computer science first and the mathematics afters, afterwards. And that's, that's how you, you, you come up with a new numerical model for CFT, which I think is more adequate for the, for the type of hardware we have nowadays. And so what are the advantages uh, from a user's perspective of Lattice Boltzmann over, you know, a, a typical approach to CFD that you'd find in the commercial tools on the market? I think one, one advantage is that everything is smoother and faster on the computer. Because you have these algorithms which run fast, you have, I would say, almost real-time computation of what is going on. You have this interactivity between the human and the computer. You see how the flow evolves, how the solution is evolving. You can interact with the solution to change the geometry, add new physics. And as things go on together between the human and the computer, get a solution. It's, it's, it's smoother. It's, it's faster. It's, it's, it, it, it's, a, a, it's a, a more lightweight approach of, of getting the physics you want. And that's the first thing. And the second, second thing is the um, complexity of the physics you get. If you want multi-phase flow, if you want turbulence, if you want chemical reactions and everything together, and usually that's what you want. Fluids are complicated. That, it's just a model which supports this and, and it runs fast. That's the big thing. It, it just runs fast. I see. So um, if I understand what you were saying correctly, um, it's more of a generative approach to uh, solving uh, this the CFD uh, problem at hand. In other words, this is um, an evolving solution. So is it inherently transient or can you also do steady state analyses? That's correct. It is inherently transient, which is because the, the physics, the real physics, is a physics of motion, of dynamics. When you take molecules and their interaction, there is the notion of dynamics there. So what we solve when we do lattice Boltzmann simulations is always time dependent. Of course, you can also solve for a stationary state. So there are special optimization techniques to make things stationary or to converge to stationary state fast. But fundamentally, the very philosophy of the method is a method for time dependent flows. Right. And if someone goes to your website and uh, looks at some of the incredibly sexy uh, visualizations that have come out of uh, out of your your solvers, one thing that uh, I think people will be surprised to see is a lot of uh, sloshing uh, fluids. You mentioned motion. So fluids, splashing, um, things that are typically considered very difficult to accomplish in traditional CFD possible, but uh, very difficult. Um, would you say that's one of the strong points for uh, Palabos? Lattice Boltzmann in general? Yes, absolutely. So uh, I, I don't know if we, we mentioned that. So Palabos is the, is the name of the software which we develop and which we, we produce at our company, which is an open source software. And yes, when I say that computational efficiency is one of the strong points, that also means that high resolution is one of the strong aspects of the Lattice Boltzmann method and of Palabos. Because if you have good efficiency, you can go to high resolution. These matters, especially in things like multi-phase flow. You take one of the traditional CFT solvers and try to do a splashing fluid with small droplets, you will always have the problem of computational efficiency. In the end, you have maybe 100 droplets. And this is not what you have in real physics. In real physics, you have 1,000 or 10,000 droplets, and all of this interact. And there is no way to model this. You have to resolve this. And that's what we have with this lattice Boltzmann method: the sufficient computational efficiency to resolve all these small structures. And that extends to uh, solids as well, right? Uh, so you can have you can easily include um, you know solid bodies interacting with the flow. I would say yes and no. So the lattice Boltzmann method is not for structural analysis, so you would not do complex elastic fluids with lattice Boltzmann and couple them with a fluid. If you wanted to do that, you probably would need a different solver for the structural analysis. But for simple bodies, yes, it's easy to do fluid structure interaction. Typically, what people like to do is uh, immersed particles, uh, simplified immersed particles, which can 
represent something biological like red blood cells in a body or it can be sand or small stones in a river or something like that and you want to embed millions of them in a fluid then yes this will go pretty easily because particles are at the theoretical level of that is Boltzmann they are at the fund fundamental level the fluid itself is through molecules so taking these molecules and taking all the kinds of particles and how ha the things interact is simple and efficient at this level. So that would be uh, solid particulates in the flow, but uh, how about you know a solid object that's um, actually affecting the flow? So maybe like a paddle that's spinning in the water and creating waves and mixing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, um, I get your point now. Of course, moving rigid bodies. That's one of the one of the other strong, strong things we have with Lottie, Lattice Boltzmann. So uh, when I was saying that we cannot model um, uh, structure, I was speaking about fluid structure interaction where the body itself is deformed ha and has some elastic motion. But if you are talking about a rigid body and you would like to have, let's say, a propeller or an impeller immersed in the fluid, that's one of the things we do with a very high computational efficiency too. So real moving bodies. Very often when you take um, CFD solvers and want to do an impeller, what the CFD solver is going to propose to you is to do a change of reference. The impeller will not move, but the whole system will move and there will be some body force representing the centrifugal forces. That's cheating. So that's not what, you, what we are doing. We do real <laughs> moving <cheating>. bodies, right? <laughs> well, and, and what you're referring to, I think, is... Um, you know, in traditional CFD, if you're going to do a pump impeller, um, you, you have a, your stationary mesh, if you will, defining most of the fluid volume. But in the area right around the impeller, you'll put a spin volume, which is a rotating reference that has to somehow communicate across that boundary between that rotating reference. It might look like a hockey puck. And across that boundary to the surrounding static mesh, it has to constantly uh, pass velocity, temperature, pressure, and, you know, all those values as part of the simulation, and that's not what you're doing. No, no, that's not what you are doing, because this approach requires that your problem is symmetric, has some cylindrical symmetry or something, and that's not what we are doing. We do moving geometries with any shape. Interesting. All right, well, um, hopefully we didn't get too deep into the weeds and lose the audience, but uh, it's, it's um, you know, it's powerful stuff. Um, let me do a little bit of housekeeping here. Let's call it linguistic, linguistic uh, housekeeping. Um, you speak, I think, probably three or four languages, correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. Um, that would be French, German, and uh, English. Okay. And um, I have to say, I am pretty sure I butcher your name every time I say it. So I say Jonas Lat, but is it Jonas Lot? What, what do you prefer in what part of the world? <laughs> <laughs> so i'm a native german speaker well not exactly german it's swiss german which is some sort of dialect we talk here in switzerland and so my, my name is pronounced jonas lat ah lat not lot okay yes the the a is a little bit more open that's correct okay so in the uh second part of this interview i'll be introducing you as Lo jonas lat <laughs> <laughs> Very good. And that brings me to my second point, which is, um, you know, when I first saw Palabos, um, I had no idea how to pronounce it. And I think I pronounce it differently every time I say it. So what's the uh, proper pronunciation from your perspective? I pronounce it Palabos. Palabos. So the, yeah, with the, with the emphasis on, 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 the, on the first part of, of the word, it's... It's funny because you are you are talking about languages and there is something about languages with that with that name uh, Palabos. So, of course, it's an acronym. Uh, Palabos stands for par Parallel Lattice Boltzmann Solver, but it's also a word in Greek. In Greek, it means crazy, and uh, I think we chose <laughs> it because because not not because we are crazy, because we we think we we just adopt an approach which is, which is different from other approaches, and also. When I said that I, I founded that company with, uh, with colleagues, many of these colleagues are Greek. It happened to be so. So that's how this Greek word came into that software. <laughs> that's interesting. Well, let's jump right into that then. So um, you started uh, with the development of an open source tool. Uh, now, that's pretty unusual. There, there are you know a lot of uh, open source tools out there. 
Um, not that many, relatively speaking, in the CAE space. So, you know, what drove your decision to go there? And, um, you know, can you tell me a little bit more about the open source nature of Palabos and how that fits in with FlowKit? Yes. Yeah. So that's, that's an interesting point. And I think we will have, we will need some time to talk about it because it's not so easy to understand for everyone because open source means something different to different people. In our case, I would say that producing an open source tool, a tool is mostly a sort of a contract with the academic world. So we, we interact a lot with academia and we get, we give them a research tool for free because we develop it open source and they can just download it. But what they gave back to us is that they read the code they, and they, they tell us what they think. If they think something is wrong or something is not adequate or something like that, they, they tell us. That's what we get back from them. It's a sort of interaction. So the reason why we started with open source is that, in my opinion, fluid dynamics is very, very complicated. Even today, in, in 2013, it's a very, very poorly understood domain. And believe me, a single company, even a big one, I don't think they have the sufficient resources to guarantee the validity of everything they are doing in all imaginable circumstances. So if we do, if we go open source, we get hundreds of academic partners all around the world who for free validate our code. Mm. They read the code and they tell us if they think something, if you are neglecting some physical phenomenon, they, they come back and tell us and then we correct that. That's what we get back. So you have a, a giant uh, arm of your development staff and QA staff um, throughout the world with hundreds of academic partners. That's exactly correct. Interesting. All right. Well, um, so lots of people, I think, are more familiar with open source. Um, if you talk about things like Linux or Firefox, and I guess, how does that style of open source differ from, you know, application in the CAE market? Yeah, it's a bit different. Um, so first of all, Linux and Firefox, they have a much bigger market than a CAE tool, right? So they, they would have a user base of millions or up to billions of people. And in CAE, that's much smaller. Um, we also have a different open source model than the one we have here at Flowkit. I think that Linux has around 100 core developers who contribute code to the Linux kernel for free. They, they just develop in their free time. And these are highly skilled developers. And in, in CFD, we, we cannot have that because CFD, it's more difficult to find a skilled CFD developer than a general purpose software developer. It's just more difficult. And it's also more difficult to debug codes. Um, to explain that, when I think when you're developing um, uh, a CAE software, if you're developing CFD, you need to be good both at software development, software engineering, and physics, and maybe numerical analysis. You need a little bit of everything. At many occasions, I have tried to put a good physicist together with a good software developer and hope that together they will be sort of a computational scientist, but this never works. They, they cannot communicate. They, you, you don't get results. You need one person who has all these skills at the same time, and they are very rare. And that's why, that's why CFD development is so difficult. We don't get, get this crowd of developers for CFD. What we, instead, what we do is we just develop the software internally in our company, in a small team, and use the crowd, the people, to validate the software. So the, 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 the open source model is different. I see. I see. Well, um, we are seeing more open source coming into the CAE world. Um, you know, probably the most well known is um, Open Foam on the CFD side of things, and we've seen that change hands now quite a bit. But you know, what role do you think open source will have for CAE? Um, you know, it sounds wonderful. There probably are some downsides, but uh, what do you see for the future? So I think that open source will be there in the future in any case, not only for CAE, but for software development in general. The thing is, if you are developing a closed, a closed source software, you are offering your client a black box. They don't know what is inside and they need to trust you that everything is correct. If you give them open source, then you're 
you say that you are willing to expose the code because you believe in it. And I think this is what people require more and more. Not only in CAE, uh, the, the most frequently used uh, operating system on, on smartphones, for example, is open source, right? Uh, uh, like the, 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 Android open, uh, the, the Android operating system and many other things. I think it's coming, it's, it's there. What role does it play? Well, I, I don't see the future, so I, 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 I cannot say. I think there will be downsides because people, will, people who misunderstand open source will think that that means that for now, from now on software is free, but nothing is ever really free in that sense. Because when you're doing CFD, a software is not sufficient. You also need knowledge. You, know, you, you need people to understand fluid, to understand that this, who interact with you to make things right. And I think this is the knowledge, we, for example, we offer at Flowkit, and at some point you, you have to pay for it. And maybe open source at the very first stage will create a misunderstanding where people think that everything is just a button click away which you download from the web. But it's not. It remains CAE. It's a difficult topic. Okay, well, uh, that takes us nicely into the next topic here, Flowkit. Um, this is your company, which is separate from Palabos. Um, and you are generating revenue on the work that has been done on Palabos today. So, um, you know, how does that work? How do you monetize uh, or build a business around open source? How are you doing it today? Um, and then what do you think that's going to look like in the future? So right now we are building our revenue through um, consulting services. Most of the time, Companies download Palabos and start using it for their own internal development. And at some point, they just want to have a, a sort of a support. If something, if some result is not the one they expected, or if they want something more sophisticated, if they want help, if they want support, they come back to us. And uh, we are selling uh, paying support options. That's our current revenue. Uh, the plans for the future are to continue like that. We are an engineering team and we like what we are doing. So we like uh, interacting with companies who use Palavos and also try to understand what they want and incorporate it into that open source software. But additionally to that, what we would like to offer to people is uh, a convenient interface to using Palavos in the cloud. So I think we will talk more about the cloud later, right? And, and so the cloud, that would mean people uh, fire up a, a web browser, uh, log onto some page, and run the software, the Palabas software, remotely on a machine somewhere, uh, or, or on, on a cluster or a group of machines somewhere in the world. Okay, I'm so going to stop you right there. Um, I, I do find that incredibly exciting. Um, so what I'm hearing is that today, Flowkit um, can help people implement uh, Palabas as is locally, uh, so they can download and install this open source uh, tool, no problem. But uh, if, they, if you need some help um, customizing it or learning how to use it, uh, Flowkit is there for you. But in the future, and this is what we'll talk about in the next episode, um, you, you'll be turning on some sort of cloud-based application um, that uses Palabos under the hood. Yes, that's correct. Okay, hold that thought. Well, that's the show for today. Uh, J Jonas, I almost said Jonas again. Jonas, I really appreciate you coming on and spending some time. Um, it's been a fun conversation. Look forward to part two. Yes, thank you, Jeff. That's all for this episode. Thanks for listening to the Life Upfront Engineering Podcast. Visit lifeupfront.com to comment and connect with me on Twitter, Google+, and LinkedIn. Also, you can really help the show by leaving a review on iTunes. Thanks again. Until next time.